Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Are you hungry? Maybe some people here are. What do you do when you're hungry? You go off in search of food, right? Now, in our country, when you go to look for food, you go to the grocery store. Maybe you order some food on DoorDash, or you go out to eat at a restaurant. You don't really go all the way to the farm anymore, unless you happen to live on one. We get all of our food right conveniently, whatever we want. But not everybody gets their food that way, and sometimes when people are hungry, they just have to deal with that hunger. Now, when you're a kid, sometimes you have to deal with your hunger because your parents are telling you you can't eat yet. It's not snack time. It's not meal time. But some people, they just can't afford to get the food they need. Or maybe where they live, it's hard to get food and it isn't available. Sometimes we take for granted the ease of access that we have for food. And it is sometimes taken for granted as a valuable commodity, but it really is. I mean, life could not function without food. And today in certain parts of the world, yes, even today, people don't necessarily have the access to food that they need. So it's no surprise then in our gospel reading, because this was an even bigger problem in the ancient world, where life was much more difficult, they didn't have the conveniences of technology, It makes sense then that when somebody tells you, hey, I met this guy that took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed like 8,000 people, you'd be like, where's he at? I'm hungry. That's pretty insane when you think about it, right? I mean, an unlimited supply of food. And actually, it's prior to the verses in our gospel reading today, but after Jesus does this, one of the reasons he leaves is he perceives that they want to basically kidnap him and make him king because he could do this with food. That's how important food is to those who need it. So it makes sense That people, they're waiting around to find out where Jesus went. And if you were paying attention, they couldn't quite figure out how did Jesus get to the other side because he didn't take a boat. Well, we know he walked on water and joined his disciples in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and then went on the same boat with them. But they stick around and wait for more boats to show up. And they board those boats and they cross the sea to chase after Jesus, their food vending machine. But are they hungry for the right thing? That's the question our text poses, not only for these people who are waiting around to follow after Jesus, but the question it poses to us. Am I hungry for the right thing when it comes to Jesus? After all, why are they seeking after Jesus? Well, Jesus answers that question for us. When they find Jesus, they get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and they say, Teacher, how did you get over here? And Jesus' first response to them is, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, in other words, not because you recognize who I really am, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. They were following Jesus because they were hungry and they wanted bread. And it sounds like some of them were there when Jesus performed this amazing miracle with the five loaves and the two fish. Because Jesus says that they ate their fill of the loaves and so now they're like, almost like, oh great bread maker, I will follow you forever. But is this what Jesus came to do? To make endless amounts of bread for people to eat? No, that's not Because the fact that these people are chasing after Jesus, the very next day, the text tells us, demonstrates what about the bread they ate yesterday? It was a temporary solution. 
They're hungry again, and now they are going after Jesus so that they can be fed. But not in the way that Jesus intends long term. See, Jesus goes on when they are asking him and following after him, and he says, Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. So, if you're somebody chasing after Jesus because you wanted some regular bread, or some miracle bread, or whatever he did the day before, and then he starts talking like this, you're probably wondering, what does he mean, food that endures to eternal life? It's a strange phrase. But before we get to that, this is a great question to ask ourselves. See, Jesus has called out the reason they're seeking after him, and we ought to ask ourselves that same question. Why am I seeking after Jesus? What am I hoping to gain from following after him, from clinging to him? Am I seeking some temporary blessing like these people were? A temporary satiation from hunger that the very next day we'll be back again? And not only that, am I seeking Jesus on my own terms, showing up and demanding that, hey, make bread for me? Or am I following after Jesus for something greater? Well, Jesus is going to make the answer to those questions clear. So after Jesus begins to tell them about this amazing food that endures to eternal life, it seems pretty natural that they're going to say, okay, what do we need to do? to be doing the works of God. How do we get this food that endures to eternal life? They could tell he was talking about something. In other words, they're saying, I want this bread that endures to eternal life, this food that won't go away. And it seems like a natural question. If you're somebody who struggles to find food and is hungry every day, just think about how much simpler your life would be if you found a loaf of bread that always endured, would regenerate or you ate it once and you never had to eat anything else again but Jesus answer is interesting to this question they're asking about what must they do and here's what Jesus says he says this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent in other words It is the gift of faith in the Son, the Messiah, that is the work of God, period. That's an incredible statement from Jesus. And it would have been alien to their ears, as it is to those unbelievers who hear the grace of the gospel for the first time. It's not how we think. In order to get something incredible and valuable, you've got to do something to earn it, to become worthy. And here Jesus says, no, the work of God is believing in him whom he has sent. And we know that belief in him is a gift of grace from the Holy Spirit. But we can resonate with this question that they ask, can't we? I mean, how often do we find ourselves thinking along the same track, even As redeemed sinners, we find ourselves falling into this way of thinking, oh man, I really screwed up this week. I didn't live up to the standard that I should as someone who is redeemed by Christ, who's following after him. I need to do something in order to become worthy of God's affection again, in order to become worthy of this receiving of these great gifts. Or maybe that thought manifests itself negatively by thinking that because we haven't done what we ought, that God no longer loves us as his children, that we're no longer worthy. We're like the prodigal son who, when he's on his last leg, comes up with this plan about how he's no longer worthy to be the son of the house, so he's going to try and be a servant. How often do you find yourself thinking in those terms? That your relationship with God is about some sort of exchange. That's how the rest of religion works. But that's not how Christianity works. That's the grace of the gospel is that Jesus doesn't demand works of worthiness. 
But he does the work to make us worthy and then gives it to us freely by grace. But they don't quite get what Jesus is talking about yet. And so after Jesus gives them this response, they say, essentially, prove it. Show us a sign that you're from God. What work can you do? Which is really ironic when you think about that some of these people were just with Jesus the day before when he fed 8,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I've never seen that. You'd think that would stick in my head for longer than 24 hours, but the text is telling me, no, Adam, it wouldn't. You would be like these folks, asking for a new sign. There's never enough signs. Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? And they even give reference to the miracle in the Old Testament that we heard in our reading today of the manna in the desert. And they say in the Old Testament, through Moses, we got manna in the desert. What can you do to prove you are from God? Once again, I'm struck by how similar we are to them. How often do we also fall into the same line of thinking Demanding signs of proof that God is real and that he's really in control, especially when things aren't going our way, when tragedy strikes or when we're uncomfortable or things don't go according to our plans, this is usually the first thing we jump to. God, show me that you're really there. Show me that you care about me. Show me that you're in control of the situation. How could you let something like this happen? Maybe some of those sentences sound familiar to you. Maybe you didn't say them, but maybe you've thought them from time to time. I know I have. And then I come to church and I'm reminded of the things that God has done that prove all of those questions that I have. I just wasn't recognizing them. So like them, we often demand proof. Show me a sign, God, that you're really there. But even in this, Jesus reminds them, just like with bread, they're still thinking about earthly things. They're only thinking about these signs of earthly prosperity, earthly satiation from hunger. And so Jesus uses that same image of the manna, and he says, first off, the manna didn't come from Moses. It came from God. And secondly, Just like the bread that I gave you yesterday, the manna was a temporary solution. They were hungry each day anew, just like you are hungry today and chasing after me for more bread. And so he says that the manna isn't the true bread of heaven. And here's what he says about the true bread of heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So in our minds, food is closely tied to life because we need it to survive. But we know that food does not give life to the world. There are people that can't get it and die of starvation every day. And on top of all of that, even those of us who eat and have plenty and more than we need, we still die. The manna the bread from the feeding of the 5,000 and the fish are not what Jesus has come to bring. Now, in his great mercy, he does provide for our earthly needs, but he's come with a far greater purpose. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world, a life that endures eternally. So now Jesus is on to something in their minds. They're thinking, oh, man, this sounds like amazing bread. Maybe it's French bread or sourdough bread. That's sort of the sort of response they have because the very next thing they say is, Sir, give us this bread always. They're ready for it. And it makes sense. Imagine from their perspective a bread that gives them life forever. Sounds great. And it sounds great to us too. 
And then we get the famous I am statement here in the very next verse. They're like, give us this bread always. And then Jesus' response is, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. This is Jesus' shocking answer. I am the bread. The very bread I've been speaking to you about, the very bread that endures to eternal life, that has come down from heaven to give life to the world, to give life to you, is Jesus himself. Jesus is saying here, I am the Messiah, I am the source of life. Jesus compares himself to the manna in the desert, but he goes beyond it. The manna in the desert, just like the bread that fed the 5,000, was not the ultimate gift of life. It was not the ultimate source of life that Jesus has come to bring. It is Jesus himself that fulfills that need. So this is what we receive when we come to the Lord's table today. Nothing short of the bread from heaven. Nothing short of the source of life eternal. Nothing short of satisfaction from an eternal hunger. The hunger for righteousness. The hunger for the love of God which we cannot earn. In our sinfulness. And to signify this in, in verse 35 at the end of our reading, Jesus goes beyond saying that your hunger will be satisfied, but he says those who come to him will neither hunger nor thirst. They will be completely satisfied. Now we know that this is a foreshadowing of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and the shedding of his body and blood for the forgiveness of the world. And we know it foreshadows the fruit of the Lord's Supper, that very body and blood given for you so that you are participating in the sacrifice of Christ and the blessing of life that it brings. But we're not done talking about that yet. Over the next couple of weeks, we're still in John 6, and Jesus is going to teach even more clearly about how this gracious gift of life in him is applied to you through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. But today I ask you the same question I started with in the children's message and at the beginning here. Are you hungry? Not hungry for mere bread. Not hungry like you would when you go to the store. But hungry for something more. Then come. Come. Come to Jesus, sit at his table, and receive his body and blood in true faith. Never again will you hunger or thirst because the source of true life is here. And it's being given freely for you who believe in him who has been sent, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the bread of life given for you, until he comes again to make all things new. Amen.